Welcome to the uh, Horn of Africa Digest uh, program. Uh, today we have uh, a stellar lineup of uh, three very well-known international personalities and commentators on issues concerning Ethiopia and the Horn of Africa. Uh, Browning Burton, uh, a senior fellow and a former director of uh, the Africa program for the Atlantic Council in Washington, D.C. Hermela Aragawi, she is a household name in Ethiopia at this moment, an independent journalist who is well known and who also has served with CBS and Al Jazeera America. And Professor Arne Fitzgerald, a professor of international security and director of the Basel School of International Affairs in Waterloo, Canada. Thank you very much all uh, for being with us today. It's terrific uh, to have a group of formidable women um, who in the views of millions across uh, the country have made a real difference to the information flows and analysis of the crisis the country has faced in the past uh, 12 months. I want to get started immediately on the different issues we would like to discuss with you today. Uh, and in doing so, I want to touch upon three main themes, the views and approaches being taken by the international actors, the impact of questionable reporting and social media, and lastly, how the country uh, sh should and can move forward. So let me first start uh, with uh, uh, Browning Burton. I want to start with you. Uh, many Ethiopians, both at home and in the diaspora, have struggled to actually comprehend the policy of the United States, which appears to favor the TPLF insurgent demands and at the expense of the democratically elected government in the country. Many Ethiopians even fear that the United States intends to force a regime change in Addis Ababa uh, to return its former allies to power. Mrs. Uh, Burton, how do you view U.S. policy objectives, and what is Washington's true intention? Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here with Anne and Hermela. It's, uh, it's really exciting to share a platform with these other um, extraordinary female academics and journalists. So thank you uh, for giving us this opportunity. Um, you know, you are completely right. I think that U.S. policy on Africa um, in general um, it is often problematic, but the policy towards Ethiopia has been particularly perplexing and has definitely caused um, an outcry on social media within the diaspora and, and recently has bled over, as we saw, um, into uh, American electoral politics. Um, in, in the, the Ethiopian diaspora has been really active in making their views on the policy known. So I don't think it's controversial for us to say that it, it, the U.S. policy is not appreciated by the uh, by a large percentage of Ethiopians, uh, both at home and abroad. And I think, obviously, the question is why the U.S. has chosen to take this tack. Why, after having been criticized so extensively for so many years um, for the financial and military collaboration that the U.S. enjoyed with the TPLF, an authoritarian regime, um, would the U.S. not be more careful in positioning itself as the TPLF seeks to launch attacks on the federal government and potentially even to return to power? It's very hard to understand. And I've struggled with it myself, but what I frequently come back to are, are two points. And the first is that um, the TPLF have been very successful using their wide network of connections um, and, and using, you know, a, a series of, of genuine atrocities that have taken place in the north of the country to construct a narrative that there is a genocide taking place. Um, and they've managed to do this, I think, to some degree with the consent of the United States. They have established a monopoly on victimhood despite the fact that there are ethnic conflicts and ethnic-based violence occurring throughout the whole of Ethiopia. Um, and so I think that, that we have to be mindful, those of us who are observing the United States, of the, the power of the word genocide and the potential danger for a democratic administration of opening itself to accusations that it, it ignored a genocide that was unfolding. We all remember the Holocaust, we all remember Rwanda, you know, individuals in the Biden administration, in particular Susan Rice, have experienced what it's like to be accused of ignoring a genocide, and I don't think they want to experience that again. 
But the second and, and very compelling um, thing to bear in mind is that the U.S. is also always very short term in its actions and its political actions. And I think the number one thing that they want is for the conflict to stop. And I think they want the conflict to stop right now, even if it means that it's going to start again a year later and a year after that and a year after that and a year after that. Because there's a really strong tendency in U.S. politics to keep kicking the can down the road. And the, I honestly believe the thing that the administration wants more than anything is to see this conflict out of the news. And they think a ceasefire is the fastest way to accomplish that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It was an in-depth analysis of the situation. I want to come uh, to, to Hermela at this point. Uh, it's kind of similar questions uh, for many people across the country are asking about the international media reports on the crisis and what role has the media, particularly with the Western media, played in reporting the Ethiopian conflict? Well, first of all, at the basics, a truthful one, right? A truthful one with the goal of informing and empowering. And when we look at the reporting on Ethiopia, for example, I had a family that was in Tigray when the war first started. And this uh, idea that this was a genocide was alarming, right? It was not, uh, it, it did not keep, it, it did not make me feel like I knew what to do. It was. It, it wasn't the war that it looked like it was, or that's not how it was being presented in the media. Um, and so that's disempowering to hear that this is a genocide because it makes you feel like you don't know what to do. So what the media could have done is painted it as exactly what it was, that there was an attack on the Northern Command and the federal government was trying to deal with the people that attacked the command. Now, for those of us on the outside, when you hear that, then when you think about your family that's there, you think, okay, they're gonna be fine. They're not a part of the conflict. If you believe that it's the genocide that is being painted to be, then you think everybody in that region that's of ethnic to grand descent is mm -hmm. in danger. And another mm -hmm. thing that I would have liked to see the media do is actually facilitate ways to communicate through the State Department, through the Red Cross. And although there was information given about how to reach out to people there, it just felt like you could send a million emails and you were just not really getting anything back. The only mm -hmm. information I was able to get is through someone that I knew that had satellite phone that could get me a voice memo from uh, a family member there. And then I had to go through my own connections through the State Department to even get a response from the State Department. So what that does when there's not truthful reporting in the diaspora is then friends and family members who would otherwise be on the same page about what this was, we start dividing. Right. Because mm -hmm. one side's told it's a genocide. The other side believes it's the war that it is because of an internal attack. And so the people and the resources that you usually lean on in times of crisis, you start to lose those people because the truth is not there for you to have a consensus on. So I think that the Western media is responsible at this point, not just for the crisis there, but all for the broken friendships, the broken families that are going to have to now be fixed after this because we cannot, we didn't have a truthful media that could bring us together. And instead we had propaganda on one side. So it's incredibly damaging beyond just the lost lives. I think it, it the impact of a, a bad media has really permeated throughout the entire diaspora. Thank you so much, Hermala. That was a comprehensive analysis of the media's and journalism's role due to some bad actors in the media in exacerbating the problem that the country seems to be facing at this moment. So, uh, Anne, um, if I may, you wrote, recently wrote a paper uh, with uh, Canadian leader and public policy expert Hugh Siegel which suggested that if democracy cannot be supported in Ethiopia, then it is a failure for democracy worldwide. What do you think that the concept of democracy in Ethiopia, which the Ethiopian people themselves are determined to pursue as a new pathway, has not been supported internationally, as we see, as Hermela said, by, by the media actors in most Western media outlets? Thanks very much. Yeah. Now, let me reiterate the comments of my co-panelists um, to say how uh, great it is to be here on a program with them. Um, democracy in Ethiopia is no different to what democracy is uh, across other uh, places in the world and regions in the world. Um, points like 
legitimacy, participation, ethical stewardship and responsibility, rule of law, transparency, accountability, human rights and freedoms, um, all of those very, very important pillars of democracy. And I think the paper that Hugh Siegel and I wrote just wanted to bring things back to that root basis and look at some of these elements in light of what's happened over the last 12 months in Ethiopia and towards Ethiopia. So let's start with the elections. Um, mm -hmm. there, there aren't many elections that are perfect elections in the world and Ethiopia's election was certainly no exception. But for those of us who have worked in Ethiopia for, for many years and know its history, it was a huge leap forward um, compared to anything that had happened in the past. There were debates over television, civil society was involved, over 100,000 local observers and over 100 international observers all confirmed that the election was based on transparent ballot box, were, was free and fair, was peaceful, was transparent, and went off in a very, very acceptable way, aside mm -hmm. from the fact that there were missing <clears throat> constituencies. And it was a great shame that the um, Tigray region was under, uh, under conflict uh, at the time and could not participate. Same with some constituencies in Wallow and near the uh, Somalia far border. But the latter two sets of constituencies did participate in September, between September 1st and September 10th. 10th. Even before that, the percentage of people eligible to vote who did vote in the election numbered around 75% of the population and then add on the 6.6 .6 million that voted between September 1st and September 10th. And you've got a turnout, a voter turnout of about 80%. So we were looking at this compared to data from elsewhere. And let me just share some of, of that data with your audience. So in, in Canada's recent federal election, 62% of the eligible voter turnout uh, voters voted and turned out for that election. Germany, 76.6%. The UK, 67.3%. South Africa, 57.5%. And Nigeria reports point to between 30 and 35 percent for this last election. So Ethiopia's experience was, relatively speaking, very good. And we felt it was important to bring out some data on this. All um, arguments should be evidence-based. The other issue concerning the election and um, the legitimacy and participation issue is that uh, COVID-19 was cited as a reason why the election was delayed. Um, a further look at the data showed that 78 other election processes in countries around the world were delayed also because of COVID. Also that international advice was given to Ethiopia to delay its election. So to then be chided for delaying the election didn't seem to fit with good practice around the world or the advice that members of the international community had um, been given. So rule of law is another critical pillar of democracy. And um, we noted that in any other NATO country, in fact, in any other civilized society around the world undergoing a terrorist attack, whether that was a single MP being attacked in a country or a soldier at the cenotaph, these incidents have happened in Western uh, countries and anti-terrorist legislation or terrorist legislation has been invoked to respond to these incidents. And indeed, uh, we would argue that it would be a dereliction of duty on behalf of the head of state not to deploy national instruments of power immediately and decisively to, um, to defuse and, and in fact neutralize these, these threats. So the timing of the conflict um, breaking out the same time as the elections and these other issues facing the government uh, really created a complex situation. And uh, I feel that it's sort of shell shock the international community as some diplomatic actors, don't forget, were longstanding uh, colleagues and friends uh, in some cases of TPLF leaders. So when that ready-made narrative um, sprung into the global community right away after the attacks were orchestrated, um, it did leave 
many people, and I would throw myself in there as well, thinking, what is going on? The absence of um, uh, you know, high level and regular updates from the government did not make um, matters easy. So uh, this well-resourced propaganda network and machine was working at Filt while the government was trying to catch up. As a result, the government was focused on um, really responding to the wolves at the door instead of rising up and delivering a high level strategic message, staying ahead of the information curve. And uh, that almost reinforced the propaganda effort in a way and reinforced words like genocide and famine, as my colleague said. Um, this took away from the very good things that uh, not just the government, but Ethiopian society writ large were supporting, like fronting 70% of the humanitarian aid effort. So, and I think just to finish on something Bronwyn said about uh, American foreign policy, it was interesting that around 26 of November, um, shortly after the unprovoked attacks on the Northern Command hit the country, uh, the Biden administration announced three priorities in, in uh, Africa. One was uh, Russia and China's uh, increasing presence. Another one was Nigeria. And another one was the conflict in Tigray. So I think the question mark is where we were and where we came to during that time in November. Where we were was an international diplomatic community that supported the political transition in 2018, that through statements that can be tracked across 2019, 2020, supported the Abbey government's reforms in many areas like security, economics, um, agro reforms, um, to a point where that support just dropped um, by way of the conflict. And I think only research will tell, further research will tell what happened around that time of the US election. But um, not to stand back and recognize the foundations for democracy and evaluate critically how those pillars of democracy were being supported and upheld is, is an oversight. Thank you very much, Professor Ann. As always, that was a very interesting point of view and analysis. I, I, would, I would like to have some more follow-up questions from the points that you raised, but I wanted to ask uh, uh, Bronin, why do you think the U.S. government imposed sanctions on Eritrea? Like uh, the country has been apparently have been um, out of the fighting since last June. So why at this time and why sanctions to begin with? What's your take on this? It's difficult to understand precisely why the United States chose this moment to levy sanctions on Eritrea. Um, I think one driver may potentially have been the release of the uh, Ethiopian Human Rights Commission joint report with the United Nations, which did provide um, some, some what could be considered neutral evidence of Eritrean wrongdoing. Um, and that may have been um, something that, that perhaps emboldened the U.S. administration to think that now is the right moment to take an action. Um, I think probably most likely what happened is that the U.S. was looking for an opportunity to do something. You know, that, that basically with the tempo of media coverage of the crisis escalating because the TPLF has been drawing closer to Addis Ababa, that the U.S. wanted to make a gesture of some kind, but didn't have the stomach to go far enough to actually sanction Ethiopia or the TPLF. And that they felt that by sanctioning Eritrea, it's a shot across the bow to say, we are doing something, we are moving forward, sanctions are getting closer, but it's not something that they had to do. Um, it, it's not as direct as actually sanctioning Ethiopia or the TPLF, the direct combatants at this point. Um, I also think that it's a very low risk gesture mm -hmm. to sanction Eritrea because it does remain fairly isolated globally. In particular though, it's worth noting that like previous gestures, that the United States has made, this one did not go anywhere near as far as it could have, in that it, it put sanctions on the economic advisor to the PFDJ, but didn't sanction Yamani Gebriab 
or as I himself. And Ayumani Gebreyev, of course, being the person who most frequently travels to Washington to engage mm. the administration in talks. Sanctioning him would have really, you know, put a curtain over the relationship. And it seems they were eager not to do that. Um, so, you know, I, I do think, you know, if, if I'm allowed an editorial comment, that this method that the United States has taken of sanctioning individuals and of yanking the AGOA access from Ethiopia is a really dangerous one. Because in both the, the Eritrea sanctions, which target the Red Sea Corporation and the AGOA um, stripping of access, these are things that are going to hurt the Ethiopian and Eritrean people. These are, these are actions that have real economic consequences, bread and butter consequences for average people. And it is really going to give critics of the U.S. government ammunition to say that, that this is not about displeasure with the ruling elite. This is about displeasure with these countries writ large. And that makes, I think, it makes it much harder for the U.S. to be perceived as a neutral party. It angers the average people when their livelihoods are threatened. Um, so, I, I, again, I, I, I don't want to make it sound like I don't believe this is misguided. It, I really believe it is. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, I've been I've been reading an article by Dr. Georgina Bayena the other day, which said that um, the, uh, the actual cancellation or suspension of the Agoa Opportunities uh, Act for Ethiopia would only would only exacerbate the problem that we already have. So um, it could not it could not be put more, more eloquently than that. Uh, we'll see how it goes it until I think the country has until January. If things change in the short time that we have until then, we may see that never taking place. So um, let me go to another uh, direction, this time for Hermela. What is the role, the, the major role that these social media movements have played on the conflict? And what is the deal with this um, um, hashtag no more movement? How is it faring along? So originally when social media was being used by news outlets, the whole idea was to supplement the work that they are doing, right? Instead of waiting for the six o'clock or seven o'clock news hour, you can now get information out to the public uh, in real time, right? So if that information is truthful and empowering, then it will, uh, it will move quickly and empower people. Now, if that information is propaganda in nature, what it does is it will spread fear even faster, right? So uh, mm -hmm. if, if we're talking about genocide and you essentially the news outlets say ethnic cleansing or genocide and they throw it out into the social media sphere and then people just fight over it, right? It's not, mm -hmm. it's not a place of uh, bringing people together that should otherwise be on the same side of things. Um, you know, I think just like uh, Professor Ann's uh, paper with Hugh Siegel uh, did, I think sometimes people need to be reminded about the basics, the basics of democracy, the basics of news, because when it comes to reporting on other countries, countries like Ethiopia or developing countries, it seems that journalists um, forget the basics or international partners that should otherwise be supporting the Ethiopian government um, as they're trying to deal with this insurgency also forget the basics. So say we're talking about uh, a scenario in local news where you have uh, a serial killer out on the loose and police officers are going door to door looking for this specific person that uh, that has been described uh, that is, uh, you know, that people know about and it's that person they're, they're going to door looking for. So if you're if the news is good and you're using social media, then everybody can immediately be, alert, be alerted that the police officers are are um, are looking for the specific person They can help identify them, whether they see them on the streets or whatever the case. And it could bring that scenario to a close quicker without anybody getting hurt. Now, if news outlets and social media are are saying the police officer himself is a serial killer, that there's a serial killer going around door to door just killing anybody, then it flips the whole thing on its head. A lot more people get hurt. The person who's actually doing damage doesn't get caught. The people like the police officers in this case that are trying to do the good work of saving people also get hurt because people are you know, reacting to them as if they're the culprit. That's essentially to me what uh, uh, news outlets using their show, social media has done and then what the result of that is people fighting. Um, and 
and then eventually what happens is rather than people coming to a sort a sort of consensus they go into their own echo chambers and they discuss the same things as opposed to being informed and having a, a more nuanced conversation so that's essentially the role that social media has played now what we're trying to do with hashtag no more is flip that do what it was supposed to do to begin with do what the news outlets were supposed to do to begin with and create a space where people can come together uh, come to a census about the basics in terms of democracy uh, truth telling what the story really is about and i think that's why uh it did take off because not only does this uh, uh apply it to Ethiopia, but a lot of people have felt like news outlets have played this really destructive role in their own respective countries mm -hmm. and that Ethiopia is not getting the basic respect that any other Western country would get if it was in the same situation. So it, in one sense, it can be really damaging, but it can also be really empowering when it's used well. Um, I think mm -hmm. we were a little bit slow to create something like this that is organized and, um, and, and that is doing the work of news. But I think part of that is because we expected the CNNs and the New York Times to do better and they did it. Beautiful. So, so how is it going? Like, how, how is it faring along the, the, the hashtag uh, no more movement? Is it, is, is it, how is it, is it like gaining momentum? And yeah, it's going well. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, it, it ebbs and flows because people get a little bit fatigued in terms of tweeting. Um, the team that we're working with also is just doing way too many things. So we're trying to create structures so that there's somebody that's dedicated to keeping that space filled with information that people can uh, share with just a few clicks by going to Linktree dot com uh, slash horn of africa hub um, now mm. the thing that we're working towards is a a protest happening this sunday november 21st the theme of that protest is just to get more americans engaged in this this is no longer an ethiopia problem particularly if there is a potential for the u.s to get involved militarily a lot of americans just saw that botched exit out of afghanistan i through my work here in LA, through local news outlet here, have talked to family members who lost people in that exit in Afghanistan. They are already fatigued with the way that the, the Biden administration is dealing with foreign policy. Uh, they've seen war after war where their children or their fathers don't come back. So uh, they don't want to see another one. So we're trying to get more people engaged with hashtag no more uh, in terms of US intervention, no more wars. Uh, built on false narratives. So as time goes on, we're going to try to build on that hashtag in different ways. And the latest way right now is the protest that's going to be happening globally in uh, more than a dozen cities. We'll have more information out on at Horn of Africa Hub in the coming days. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, let, me, let me go to Professor Ann on a number of your recent publications and in interviews, including the one that you had the last time you were in Ethiopia and you, you graced us with your honor when uh, you attended as a panelist on our Horn of Africa Digest program last time in Addis Ababa. You had some um, scenarios, possible scenarios, that you have put in, on your written publications, and at the same time, uh, some of them have uh, different perspectives as opposed to uh, what other people think. What are the potential scenarios that you see as a country comes out from this harrowing uh, 12 months of conflict? And how do we bring an end to this crisis and achieve a lasting peace? And do, uh, related to that, do you really think the United States, however unpredictable their policy direction may be, uh, the United States would be um, seriously considering to intervene militarily? One of the scenarios, Professor. Thank you. Lots of questions there. Um, I know. <laughs> start with the last one. I don't think uh, external military intervention is justified. Uh, if there is an extension or a request for help and assistance in monitoring or verification in the future, depending on how the situation unfolds and plays out, then that might be something that would be considered. But military intervention, no. Um, Okay, so I think the first thing that needs to happen is the fighting needs to stop. Uh, nothing can happen when fighting is erupting, blocking roads, um, creating disruptions to uh, agricultural progress, humanitarian delivery, um, governance generally, uh, logistics generally. 
uh, dip diplomatic activity generally. So the fighting has to stop and both sides need to be incentivized uh, to stop the fighting. The uh, TPLF need to be incentivized in some way because don't forget, we've heard calls for months now, months and months on end. We've heard calls for both sides to end fighting and engage in a ceasefire. The uh, government engaged in a ceasefire in June. Uh, that has not been reciprocated. The government has an absolute duty to protect its citizens, including its uh, region of Tigray citizens, but the unilateral ceasefire prevents it from going across the border and having a presence in doing that as it stands at the moment. So what it is doing is um, maintaining a position in Amhara and Afar, trying to repel the incursions that are coming across the border. So an incentive for the government to step down from its defensive position, stop the airstrikes would be for the TPLF to stop those incursions into Amhara and Afar in their efforts to try to reach and block critical arteries that would give them a more powerful position at a negotiating table, which is always the overall objective of insurgency warfare. Um, the incentive on the TPLF side would be um, punitive measures, I would say, punitive measures that would put at risk assets of the leaders um, put travel restrictions into place, maybe threaten to freeze foreign assets, foreign bank accounts, but something has to incentivize those leaders. Um, and so the next thing I would say would be humanitarian support, not just humanitarian support, but support for agricultural productivity to try and help these regions that are very food stressed in the North Wallow area, um, uh, in areas in Afar, and also well near the Afar border and uh, Tigrayan communities. And, and that requires a coordinated effort and strategy. And it all also requires enabling space that is not seeing such a conflict between humanitarian goals and insurgency goals. This is why the situation for humanitarian delivery has been so difficult and in some cases unworkable because mm. uh, humanitarian goals are very incompatible uh, to insurgency goals and the governance structure that the international community has been left to work with in Tigray is prioritizing an insurgency operation. Um, I think striking the right balance between accountability and forgiveness, the Ethiopian people which are united in a way that we've never seen in, in, in um, uh, recent history is the greatest asset for the government at the moment, a government that has um, responded and stood up to the democratic commitment that the in the, the democratic pathway that the Ethiopian people have chosen. And rule of law is critical to that. So uh, people will have to be held accountable for high crimes in some way. But forgiveness will also have to be um, demonstrated uh, in, the, in the form of amnesty, especially for those who had no choice but to um, follow what the leaders encouraged them to do, those who are part of the TPLF, but because of the nature of vanguard politics, you know, most people are members of the TPLF who live in the region of Tigray and had nothing to do with command and control and decisions being made over attacks and atrocities and, and other war-related issues. So the balance will have to be struck between that. Also, I would say a balance needs to be struck between um, distinguishing uh, between collateral damage of war and human rights abuses and atrocities that, that require accountability. Um, hearing the voices of the people as well, um, really getting in touch with grassroots voices, uh, gathering local leaders, finding out exactly what the objectives are, what the um, grassroots level of the Tigray regional population uh, would like to see happen in the future, um, providing enabling space for those discussions to be had, uh, inviting legitimate um, opposition leaders and party members into that discussion, 
and a massive, and I'll finish with this, a massive and unrushed uh, investment supporting reconciliation, uh, healing, psychosocial support, um, support for alternative livelihoods. Um, the social fabric needs to be mended in Ethiopia. And there's lots of experiences around the world that the country can look at. My own country, where I'm speaking to you from now, Canada, um, still goes through an ongoing colonization process and healing process that comes with that and our reconciliation processes with our wonderful indigenous communities. And, um, you know, there's lots of other regions of the world that have faced or are still facing these challenges. Social fabric is so important as a foundation for everything else to thrive in a country. So I would, I would just say that those are some of the many things that have to happen moving forward. Okay, very interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, let me come with the same uh, question to Bronin. Um, well, similar in a way. Um, so um, as we go along in trying to get out of this, this, this calamitous situation, uh, what role do you think should the United States play? If at all there is some, I mean, there, there should be. Um, in, your, in your own analysis, what role do you think the United States, uh, what, what, what they can do, the, the government of the United States can do uh, to help to play a constructive role in bringing about the peace that we are, we are so much looking for? I have recently been hearing um, what I consider to be very dangerous um, advice to the US government, that it should double down on its current policy of, of mm -hmm. punishing the Ethiopian government um, for human rights abuses, for, for its refusal to negotiate with the TPLF. And I think that is the worst possible strategy that, that Washington could um, engage in at this moment. One of the primary problems with the U.S. response is that punitive sanctions have been placed on Eritrea. Punitive economic measures have been taken against Ethiopia, but no measures have been taken against the TPLF. In spite of the fact that the TPLF is an insurgency, in spite of the fact that they did throw the, the first punch, so to speak, in this conflict by attacking the Northern Command, and in spite of the fact that they did draw Eritrea into the conflict through the missile launches, at Asmara um, and other occupied civilian territories. Um, it, this is really, I think, the major reason that so many Ethiopians and other Africans increasingly are looking at the US response and saying that it is biased in favor of the TPLF. And it's a tremendously dangerous precedent for Washington, I think, to be viewed as supporting an armed insurgency in these countries. And I believe that if you look across the Horn of Africa now at the state of, of U.S. relations, it's dire. If I were sitting on the National Security Council, I would be really worried at this moment because Somalia is calling for you know, getting rid of Amazon. Eritrea's relations with the U.S. have never been worse. Ethiopia's relations with the U.S. have really not been worse since the Derg was in power, I think, in terms of warmth between the two, na uh, the two nations. And the last bastion is Djibouti, which is really, really deeply um, invested in its relationship with China. So the U.S. foothold in the Horn of Africa is looking very fragile, and the consequences of its getting Ethiopia wrong are potentially very severe. So the U.S. has every reason to stop and step back and ask itself, how can it be viewed as a constructive force in this conflict? And given its history, that's going to be very, very, very hard. But its failure to sanction the TPLF, particularly, you know, I want to endorse what Anne has said about uh, the, the relative vulnerability of TPLF officials who are thought to have significant assets overseas, who certainly have family overseas. Um, they are most likely far more um, susceptible to the impacts of sanctions than Ethiopian government officials or certainly Eritrean officials would be. The failure of the U.S. to use that leverage is very, very telling, and it needs to be corrected because the, at the rate it's going, I really fear for U.S. capacity to exert any influence on the horn in future if it doesn't right the ship urgently. And I think the way, the way to do that is, is really quite clear. That was very, very interesting. Um, let me 
go back to Hermela. Um, since we are talking about Professor Ann has or also raised the issue of reconciliation and uh, meaningful dialogue um, by those, by every one of those who have been involved in this. Uh, so, sticking to what we have been talking about, Hermela, what do you think uh, regarding the way moving forward to heal and bring about peace? Uh, how is it possible to use, or how can it be possible to use both media, social and mainstream, uh, for the purpose of reconciliation in the country and, and its people? What's your take on this? I think we can use media for what it's supposed to be used to inform people about what has been happening uh, all across the country in a truthful, unbiased way. And then also tell the stories of people, you know, stories that humanize people regardless of their ethnicity, ethnicity regardless of where in the country they're living in. Um, you know, I think more people would have empathy for certain things that are going on in Tigray if the only people that were uh, not telling, or the, the only people that are telling the stories of Tigray are just essentially TPLF officials and through the Western media as well, right? So when that's the only place it seems to be coming from, then it's really difficult for people to have empathy for what's going on there. I think the joint investigation by the UN Human Rights uh, High Commissioner and Ethiopian Human Rights Commission did appear to have uh, you know, unbiased information showing that everybody suffered and all parties to the conflict um, did some damage. So it, I think documents like that can really bring people uh, to be more grounded. Um, what I'm hoping to do through the media space is just uh, uh, kind of undo all this hate and propaganda that has not just been happening in this last year, but maybe in the last 30 years. Um, one thing I, uh, I put out a question on Twitter um, asking people to reach out if they've had their families broken or lost friendships because of the false narratives in this war. And the amount of response I got, honestly, was overwhelming. I'm still going through it. I mean, people that have been married for 30 years and because they could not find a credible source of information, they're uh, with their children involved, their their families are, are, are falling apart. I mean, I hope in, in most cases it's not permanent, that it's something that can be fixed with time. But that, to me, is just indicative of how, how rotten journalism has become, at least when it comes to reporting overseas, like in Ethiopia. Um, and so we're going to have to do a lot of work. Like Professor Ann says, uh, said, it's going to take a long time to bring people back together. Um, and so I think if you're sharing stories of Tigrayans, for example, that do not support what the TPLF has done, then that you, you can bring some people together with that. Um, it, it, it doesn't help that uh, there's not a whole lot of people like me that think outside the box. There's the, there are people such as Solomon Weldegarima, who's in Addis, who's Tigrayan, who's Ethiopian, who, who knows very well what the TPLF has done and is trying to help uh, innocent Tigrayans that are not involved. So when you have people like that coming out of every community or every ethnicity or every political group, then there can be a consensus among people that are like-minded, that believe in honesty, that believe in compassion um, and integrity in their work, even when it comes to TPLF. Let's separate the individuals who are just caught up in that uh, versus the individuals that are actually making certain decisions because it, it, I think Professor Ann put it well there's going to be a balance between or have to be a balance between accountability and forgiveness as much as some people might want to throw away the TPLF wholesale uh, we're gonna it, it's probably best to pick out certain individuals uh, that can actually work with the government that are working with the government um, if, I think blanket uh, statements about any particular group or ethnicity or community is what does a lot of damage and we can use media to get more specific to to make it about individuals so that you can humanize um certain stories that are happening that's 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 very interesting so uh, and um for all those uh, for all that to be possible what hermela has been saying and also uh bronwyn has been raising these points uh, the, the first most important thing is for the country to be secure. Um, as, as a professor of international security, should have some um, perspectives on uh, what are the, the security threats that Ethiopia faces like now in the medium term and possibly in the long term as well. How do you see that? 
I think what Hermela was talking about in terms of knowledge and information is uh, really pointing to information and knowledge security that needs to be upheld and supported moving forward and which has been over the last 12 months, one of the country's biggest threats. So there are implications there for strategic communications, for um, the government to really get serious about public affairs, not just public affairs centrally, but public affairs functions within the military. Um, you know, when we're looking at British military coverage and some Canadian military coverage, US military coverage abroad, we always see reporters embedded with battalions to um, provide sort of on ground re real time feedback, which of course is vetted um, through the, the military channels. So it's usually got a high reliability factor in some cases. So um, I think that culture of public affairs and information projection really needs to be um, invested in, in a way that hasn't been in the past. Uh, it keeps the world educated on this wonderful country. It keeps um, the narratives ahead of the game and the information curve and the toxic, the very, very toxic social media narratives and, and the bad behavior that plays out on social media. Um, and, and that's an important pillar of democracy as well, making sure you bring the people um, forward with you. It's a very important management principle, right? Never rush out ahead and try to um, make it to the finish line first. You've got a whole team to bring with you. And in this case, it's the population. So internal communication and external projection and communication. So um, that has implications for access to reliable information. Um, and now that civil society is really coming together across the country, it's something that civil society may uh, think about doing, um, creating some research on what has proven to be reliable, uh, ranking those sources, developing a rubric for ranking those sources, a dynamic rubric that can change all the time, um, but that can serve as some frame of guidance for the Ethiopian population so they know what to consume. I mean, uh, wider than the Ethiopian population uh, because we've been inundated throughout the last 12 months with commentary analysis, uh, some commentary that hasn't been peer reviewed because everybody's trying to rush to get it out. And therefore, um, the, the critical triangulated database, evidence-based bases uh, can be called into question on a lot of fronts. So productive relationship between civil society and government, government, civil servants aren't in most cases meant to do research in their day-to-day -day jobs, but there's a huge research community out there, some very good universities across the country bringing those universities together like a knowledge infrastructural network would be a fantastic idea and a contribution to um, the government's resources for informing meaning, meaningful policy. Um, education and skill sets, you know, if, if, you, if you don't have a skilled and educated population that knows how to manage their national resources, space opens up for other people to come in and, and manage them for you. So relevant education and skill sets have never been so important for the country, for the region before, to capitalize on all those opportunities that um, are there waiting to be exploited across the region. National security reforms, I would say the regional security architecture as it stands at the moment is um, set up for conflict, is set up for war. And we don't want any more of that to happen. Uh, these direct lines that the regional militia groups have to the regional presidents um, are problematic when the regional leadership has a difference of opinion or a difference of view with the federal center. And that can happen. I mean, here in, in Canadian provinces, we've had different uh, parties being represented at the leadership level of the regions that is different to the leadership of the federal center. And you know, there are mechanisms to try to get through those differences of views. But when you have an entity that retains a monopoly on the use of force, a monopoly on the use of violence, that can respond in both directions, 
then brought together, you've got grounds for a conflict. So um, addressing the Leo Heil structure, um, making sure uh, there's a transition of some of these structures under the federal authorities makes sense. Um, also a clear national strategy uh, throughout the country and writ large is, is important. Why is it important? One, so um, to manage the expectations of the people. I mentioned earlier that a massive investment has to go into reconciliation and healing. This may take away from other priorities that the government was considering, but it's a very, very large priority that needs attention. So communicating that and communicating how the country is going to go about it, as well as the national security reforms and the economic reforms is important. So the people's expectations can be managed. Um, secondly, it's for the international community's expectations to be managed too. A country is more resilient when it can turn around and say, we have a strategy, here are the priorities. Uh, you could helpful, helpfully support us in this area. And thirdly, to hold the government to account. If it promises uh, delivery in these areas, then at those critical milestones, when the population should reflect on its performance, there are pillars for accountability. And I think lastly, I would say diplomatic relationships um, in the region, but uh, internationally. And diplomacy works best in person. So I would urge the government to consider a, a, a decent balance between the digital mm. diplomacy strategies that it is developing at the moment and those traditional in-person uh, strategies that um, can be very powerful and helpful. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Hermela, one final question, and we are just about to wrap up the session. So, um, I mean, you already have sacrificed a big deal of your time, and we thank you so much. Many Ethiopians who are watching this program, uh, millions of them would be very uh, thankful, I know. So, um, Hermela, just one last question. Um, and after that, I'll give uh, each one of you, Professor and uh, Ms. Bronwyn and uh, Hermela, a personal reflection of one minute, if, you, if there is any message that you would want the Ethiopians to know from your personal perspective, just one minute message at, at the end of the session. So you could, you could take the time to think about that while Hermela gives me her uh, final comment on and a very quick report uh, from her perspective, Hermela, from your perspective um, in the US since you're there. Uh, is, how is the diaspora living there having an impact on the conflict? Uh, both positive and negative. What's, what's your refle reflections or perspectives on this as, as, as one living in, in LA, right? So I think for a long time, the diaspora was uh, playing a very toxic role. Uh, the hashtag Tigray genocide folks and the activism that they led and really brought good, well-meaning people into that whole world that, that, that thought they were getting involved in a humanitarian issue. They were sort of de, uh, dominating um, the conversation uh, in, the, in the social media space. They were also raising a lot of money uh, that much of, what, much of which likely went into war efforts. Um, and so in so many ways, I think if the diaspora wasn't there, maybe things would be a lot better. Um, but I think what we are trying to do with hashtag no more is getting all those silent majority, uh, the ones that were sort of sitting back and just watching all this unfold and 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 felt a little bit powerless because the 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 dominating narrative was a toxic one, a one that was talking about genocide, one that was telling people to stop being friends with your Amharan friends or with your whatever friends. Um, and really just deepening the divisions and the fear amongst people that were also worried about their families um, in Tigray. So uh, I think a lot of us learned um, uh, different lessons. Those that were silent learned not to be uh, silent. Those of us that didn't really fully understand the context of the politics have learned. Um, and so a year in, I think that the diaspora will play a much more constructive role and those voices that uh, intend to divide and destroy the country will eventually take a back seat. Thank you so much, Hermela. That was a, a, a clear perspective. I very much hope so as well, um, that the, the movement would have a positive in, impact than the, the tremendously negative impacts that they had before. I very much hope that it would change for the better soon with, with the contributions from people like you, reasonable and balanced people like you and 
and then Professor Arne, an Ethiopian enthusiast and very well uh, knowledgeable about the country and the horn. And uh, Ms. Bronin as well. I mean, it's been very nice talking to you this time. So uh, before we wrap up the program, once again, I thank you very much. But uh, let me give you a chance. Let me start from uh, Bronin. Um, what personal reflections or messages that you would want Ethiopians to, to, to know or you want to, to relate to Ethiopians? In just one minute. And then Professor Anne, and then the final would be Hermelas. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's been a tremendous pleasure. And I appreciate the opportunity to offer a personal reflection. Um, you know, I, this, um, this conflict has been exhausting for all of us. And as Hermela was saying, it has shattered friendships, um, longstanding friendships, as, as people have fought passionately um, to represent their views. Um, from, my, from my standpoint, I have to say, you know, I've been fighting bad policy, bad U.S. policy in the Horn of Africa for years and years. Um, and my first my first major disappointment was the um, the U.S. backed uh, the U.S. backing of Ethiopia's invasion of Somalia in 2006. And I have to say that, you know, for all of of the animosity that's expressed on Twitter and for all of the heartbreak, it's caused everybody, I think, to to see the um, the vitriol that's been spit out online. I have to say that every day I wonder if Twitter had been around in 2006 as Ethiopia was on the verge of invading Somalia. And if Ethiopians and Somalis had the kind of voice then that they had now, if the invasion would have been able to occur, would it have happened? If Somalis could have gone online and said, hey, the Union of Islamic Courts is not controlled by Al Qaeda. This is grassroots, this is democratic. We want this, this is our way forward. Um, and I see that playing out now in this conflict in Ethiopia. And I'm tremendously proud of people who are taking to you know, social media and to their neighborhoods and, and walking the streets and calling their congressmen and doing everything they're doing to ensure that US policy does not grow dramatically astray again, because it has, it always has the potential to do that. So my my response to this is that as, as difficult and ugly, frankly, as this conversation has been, I think the outcome may be positive. And I'm really, I'm really honored to have had an opportunity in my lifetime to watch Africans finally getting a say in what U.S. policy in Africa looks like. Thank you so much. Thank you really so much. That was, that was so inspiring. Uh, let me go to Professor Ann. One minute reflection, and then I'll give a chance to Hermela, and then we will wrap up today's session. Thanks, Daniel. Oh, I couldn't have said what Bronwyn just said better. Um, I, it has been a very uh, tough 12 months for everyone, um, but there have been some rays of light and some positive outcomes in terms of how the people have come together, shown the world what Ethiopian and Ethiopians are really all about. That is resilience, uh, unity, pride, pride in their country, pride in their peoples, pride in their nations, their culture. And um, I've never been so impressed as I have been seeing this play out in the country and more and more we're seeing that vibe catching. I'm a member of a number of um, uh, fora uh, where there are debates that um, take place on a digital platform and it's great to see more Tigrayan uh, voices coming out and searching for ways to make a contribution, expressing their unhappiness with the situation and what the insurgent movement is doing and the way we've seen these things play out historically and in the past we will see more fissures and fractures i'm sure um, we've got to be very welcoming of those fissures and fractures um, and and very understanding in terms of the position many of these individuals and groups have come from um, so stay together stay resilient uh, and um, i guess i would just say I, I, I miss not being in Ethiopia, especially on a day when we've seen the first snow come down in Canada. So thank you very much for having me, Daniel, and thanks to my co-panelists. Thank you so much, Professor Anne. Um, 
I, I'm sure the voices of reason would win. The fracture in the fissure would we'll only bring reason towards the, the center point. So I hope, I very much hope so. Uh, and I share your optimism and thank you so much for the, the personal reflection. <clears throat> so Hermela, let's see your personal message for Ethiopians at, at all uh, spectra and <clears throat> we'll wrap it up. Thank you so much. Daniel, thank you so much for this opportunity. It's such a pleasure to be on with Bronwyn and Professor Anne. There's a quote that says, uh, you don't wake people up, you find the others. And I feel like I found the others. And it's it's just uh, really great to be on this uh, platform with, with both of the uh, these ladies. So I guess what I'd say to the Ethiopian people is I think the lesson that we've learned is do not let other people tell your story because they will uh, <laughs> they will flip it on its head and then you'll be on the defensive. Um, tell your own stories, tell it on social media, put it together. Everyone's just going to have to be a journalist right now. So in, in, until until we build something that, um, you know, that is big enough to be able to 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 objectively tell the stories of people in the Horn of Africa, I think that everyone has to be sort of a citizen journalist and be diligent and um, and and take part in that. And then in general, I would just say, you know, Let's uh, let's let's try to mend these friendships, uh, families that have been broken. Let's uh, tell the truth, shame the devil, as they say. Let's not let the impact of this war um, be bigger than it needs to be. I, I love the way Professor Ann put it. Let's find that balance between accountability and forgiveness. Everyone sort of dug their heels in, and and I get it. I get it. I, I fight with that as well. But um, I think ultimately we have to think big picture and and just find ways to to. To, to reconciliate and, and to to fix what uh, what can be fixed. So that's that's all I'd like to say. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to all the three of you. It has been a tremendous honor. I cannot describe it enough. The African uh, Renaissance Television Services, which has a wide range of viewership, and most Ethiopians who are so grateful uh, for your staunch uh, stand for truth and, and, and reason. And as I said earlier, I'm sure with people like you, uh, at the end of the day, reason would win and we would be having the, the peace that we have been longing for so, for so long. Thank you very much again. This is not going to be our um, uh, final session. We'll be, I'm, I'm, uh, we'll be looking forward. Uh, our viewers would mostly be interested in seeing such brilliant minds so we'll be having more <clears throat> sessions in the coming days. Uh, uh, and then I very much hope that you'll be able to. And I thank you so much for the time that you spared to discuss this very important and uh, uh, critical uh, points at this critical juncture in the country's history. Thank you very much and have a very blessed day, all of you. Bye, Hermela. Bye, Professor. Bye, Browning. Thank you. Very much, viewers. Uh, this this has been a, a Horn of African Digest program from the African Renaissance Television Services. We had the greatest pleasure of having brilliant minds, three women of international stature, academia, and uh, journalistic uh, integrity, like Hermela Aragawi, Professor Anne Fitzgerald, and um, Brown in Burton. Um, so it has been another session which we'll hope we'll have another one very soon. Thank you very much and have a very good time.